Good day, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to this lecture on drug, uh, drug design and discovery, and specifically on products and delivery systems. So what we've done up to now, we just looked at the drug design and discovery process in, uh, in ways in which we can identify lead compounds, um, also do some structural modifications to modify these lead compounds, and then also uh, the ways in which we can then do all of these structural modifications by doing maybe a homologation or doing um, certain functional group modifications, also functional group modifications to increase the lipophilic nature of um, your new drug compound. So all of that we've done up to now. And the next part is our prodrugs and drug delivery systems. Now prodrugs is basically also a structural modification technique that we can use to improve the properties of a drug. So we can maybe improve um, its, its stability, we can maybe improve uh, its activity, its, uh, its ability to reach the site of action. We can also modify the lipophilic nature thereof. Maybe if you want a drug that crosses the blood-brain barrier, then that can also be made. So let's have a look at what a prodrug is. So a prodrug is a pharmacologically inactive compound. So this is very important to note. It's an inactive compound. So the intact drug, the drug that you will see in the pharmacy, is inactive. And this inactive compound is converted to an active drug by a metabolic biotransformation. So it's an intact drug that you get in a pharmacy, and once you get it, to take it in vivo. What happens? There's a, bio, a, a, a metabolic biotransformation that takes place, thus giving us the active drug um, inside the body. So this is something very important to note, and this is also the definition of a prodrug. So this transformation can either be enzymatic or non-enzymatic. Enzymatic um, through um, enzymes such as the esterase and amidase enzymes, and a non-enzymatic is just through hydrolysis. So maybe if you get into an acidic environment, like for instance in the gastrointestinal tract, then hydrolysis can happen non-enzymatically. So ideally, the conversion of your intact prodrug should occur as soon as the desired goal for designing the prodrug is achieved. So if you design the prodrug to specifically cross the blood brain barrier and act in the central nervous system, you don't want the intact prodrug to metabolize before it crosses the blood brain barrier. So the prodrug needs to stay intact and only metabolize once, once it crosses the blood brain barrier, it's in the central nervous system, and then the metabolism can happen and the pharmacologically active compound within the prodrug can then be released um, enzymatically or non-enzymatically. I'll show you a few examples of this a little bit later in this presentation. So also important to, to note is that you get prodrugs and soft drugs. So a prodrug is, is an inactive compound. It's an inactive compound that requires metabolism or hydrolysis to give the active form. So that's important to note for a prodrug. A soft drug is basically any other medicine that you get. So a soft, soft drug is already the active form. So it's the active chemical agent in a soft drug. It uses metabolism to promote excretion. So it doesn't need metabolism to form the active form. It's already in the active form. It only uses metabolism to promote excretion. So please make a note that um, there's a difference between a prodrug and a soft drug and note that most of the drugs currently on the market are soft drugs. They do not require metabolism to give the active form. So about 10% of all marketed drugs are prodrugs. But this percentage is increasing as drug developers use prodrugs to improve the drug formulation and pharmacokinetics. And you can maybe add in there as well, the, as, well as pharmacodynamics because you can even improve the activity of your drug using this prodrug approach. So please have a look at these two papers. These two papers um, show us the history of prodrug from where they firstly identified prodrugs from chance and then also how they use rational design to develop prodrugs. I think this will also assist you in your drug design project. Um, if you're interested in doing a prodrug assignment, this will definitely be a paper that will guide you through the whole process. 
And then another paper uh, that's also important is that products are designed and clinical applications in which you can use products. So both of these papers are very important um, and it gives you a nice overview of products and you can really use it in your drug design assignment. It is not necessary to go and study these uh, two papers. These two papers are just there for background reading and for those of you who are interested in developing a product in your big drug design and discovery uh, project. So why do we use prodrugs? So why do we have a drug that is inactive and only gets activated by metabolism? So there are a few reasons why we want this. Is first of all, we can increase the water solubility of um, a drug by using a prodrug approach. So sometimes if you want to use an IV injection, an intravenous injection, the drug needs to be soluble in water because when water is your, is your vehicle that you use in which you dissolve your active if you want to use it as an IV solution. So you need to then increase the water solubility so that it can be injected in a small volume. So certain drugs are really not um, uh, water soluble. So a way that you can increase the water solubility is through the prodrug approach. I'll show you a few examples of this a little bit later. Then also, you can improve the absorption and distribution of a drug. And for instance, if you want to increase the lipid solubility of your molecule to give it the ability to penetrate certain membranes for better absorption. So we've already seen in um, our previous drug design and discovery lectures the importance of lipid solubility and the importance of a log P and a log D value. And we also saw that there needs to be a balance between lipid solubility and water solubility. And you can actually then adjust that balance of water and lipid solubility through using a prodrug approach. Then also, site specificity. Uh, to target a particular organ or tissue, um, if a high concentration of certain enzymes is at a particular site, or append something that directs the drug to a particular site. So I'll show you an example of how you can use a prodrug approach to make a drug more site-specific. Um, and so that it is just has a localized effect um, on a specific target or a specific organ. So you can even use that um, using a prodrug approach. Then, as we all know, certain drugs are not stable um, and they may undergo rapid first-pass metabolism. So you can even adjust the structure of your compound using a prodrug approach or protect the actual active of your prodrug uh, by using uh, of your active using a prodrug approach and in most of the cases we use this to avoid first pass effects so first pass metabolism liver metabolism so you can improve the stability to prevent rapid metabolism using the prodrug approach as well and also we know that there are certain drugs that needs to be for prolonged release and you can even um, adjust the, the release or, or the rate at which a drug gets released using a prodrug approach. So it's to attain a slow, steady release of the drug. You can also make a, a drug less toxic until it reaches the site of action or even after it's reached the site of action just to make the overall toxicity of the drug less using prodrug approach. Then also, in some cases, in some drugs, there are poor patient acceptability. So for instance, um, if you have a drug that has an unpleasant taste or an unpleasant odor or it causes some gastric irritation, then you can also use the prodrug approach to improve patient acceptability of your drug. Then formulation problems, uh, to convert a drug that is maybe a gas or a volatile liquid into a solid. So you can even do that to do some uh, prodrug um, uh, approaches in which you can, uh, can um, change the physical form of your, your drug using the prodrug approach into maybe a solid compared to a gas or a volatile liquid, which is not, a, not um, really that useful um, in, in, in medicine if you have a gas or a volatile um, liquid. So all of this, the utility of prodrugs are very important. Um, this is a nice longer uh, type question that I can ask look how you can use prodrugs and you will also see as we go through these um, slides I'll show you a few examples so I can ask you maybe a 20 more question where I can ask you about the utility of prodrugs you note down these eight different um, types of utilities of prodrugs or uses of prodrugs and I can ask you to provide with each um, relevant uh, um, uh, examples as well so then you need to be able to provide the examples and we'll go through some of the examples um, just now. 
So important before we continue with the actual examples of prodrugs is that we basically get two types of prodrugs known as a carrier link prodrug as well as a biopreursor prodrug. So the main difference between a carrier and a biopreursor prodrug is that a carrier link prodrug is a compound that contains an active drug linked to a carrier group that is removed enzymatically. So I think the most important part in this sentence is this word linked. So it's the active drug linked to a carrier group. Whereas a biopreursor prodrug, it is not a active linked to a, a carrier. It is a compound that is mod metabolized by molecular modification into a new compound. So basically, so you, have, you have a compound there that can undergo metabolism and there's certain functional group modifications within that compound that happens through the metabolism making the active drug. So this is uh, also a case where, which is a drug or is metabolized further into a drug, not just a simple cleavage of a group from a prodrug. So I need you to underline this and note this, that the biopreursor prodrug is not just simple cleavage of a group from a prodrug, whereas carrier link prodrugs are the link, the active, the link, and the carrier group, and it, it, it just through metabolism, then that carrier group gets released. So that's the difference between a carrier link and a biopreursor prodrug. So the carrier link prodrugs are also divided into three types, known as a bipartite, a tripartite, and a mutual carrier link prodrug. So the bipartite comprises of one carrier attached to the drug. So it's just a carrier that's attached to the, to the drug. Then a tripartite is a carrier connected to a linker that is connected to a drug. So it's carrier, linker, drug. So that's then a, a tripartite prodrug. And a mutual prodrug is two usually synergistic drugs attached to each other. So it's two drugs that get uh, linked to each other through a linker, but both of the two, uh, two drugs are active. So the, in this case, you don't have a carrier. It's just two active drugs that are linked together. And I'll say there are same, some um, advantages of using mutual prodrugs, and I'll show you some examples of that a little bit later. So the most common activation reaction of carrier link prodrugs is known as hydrolysis that can happen through uh, by, uh, by two enzymes that can cause this. It's known as the esterase enzymes and the amidase enzymes. So the hydrolysis or the metabolism of carrier link prodrugs mainly happens through esterase enzymes or amidase enzymes that can break that linker, and then um, what happens is then only the active drug gets released, maybe at the site of action or after um, it's reached a certain organ or, or so. So those are the different the, the types of carrier link prodrugs. We already discussed biopreprecursor prodrugs, but I would just like to read through this again. So a biopreprecursor prodrug is a compound metabolized by molecular modification into a new compound, which is a drug or is metabolized further into a drug, not just the simple cleavage of a group from the prodrug. Again, that is important and the main difference between a bioprecursor and a carrier link prodrug. And a bioprecursor prodrug uses oxidative or reductive activation. So it's not through um, enzymatic cleavage using um, using um, esterase and, em and amidase enzymes, it uses oxidative and reductive activation. So the way that I always remember oxidative and reductive, oxidative is to add to the molecule. So there's certain functional groups that get modified, and maybe there's additional carbons that get added to a specific uh, compound. Now, so that's an oxidative reaction. A reductive um, a reaction. It's basically where certain functional groups get reduced. So if you maybe had a, an, 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 a, a carbonyl group on your structure, so maybe it underwent some metabolic interactions where the carbonyl group gets removed. So that's the difference between oxidative and reductive. Oxidative adds, reductive takes away from the chemical structure. So these are the two main activation processes that gets used with bioprecursor prodrugs. So, how do we choose 
an ideal drug carrier. So we have our active compound. We've already now identified that there are certain problems with the active. So maybe it's not stable enough, maybe it's not active enough, maybe it's not reaching its site of action. Um, so there may be a, a, new, a, a few undesirable properties with the active. So we can then use this prodrug approach by using a carrier, now specifically for the carrier-linked prodrugs. So the ideal drug carrier that should be used when you do the, when you do the prodrug is a, uh, approach is it should protect the drug until it reaches its site of action. So that carrier group needs to protect the drug until it reaches its site of action. It will have no use that, for instance, in the gastrointestinal tract it can't protect the drug anymore and maybe the drug doesn't get absorbed so it doesn't even reach its site of action. So it needs to protect the drug until it reaches the site of action. Also, localize the drug at the site of action. So if you want something to work in the central nervous system, it needs to cross the blood brain barrier. So this carrier can then carry it across the blood brain barrier and enable it to localize in the central nervous system and be effective in the central nervous system. That's just one example of a localization of the drug. Also, allow for release of the drug. So the drug needs to be released at the site of action. You can't use a carrier that is so stable that even when it reaches the site of action, it just stays an intact prodrug and it never undergoes metabolism. Then the active will never be released. So the carrier needs to allow for release. It also needs to minimize host toxicity. So, for instance, you can't use a carrier drug that has some toxic effects or some side effects. You want to use a carrier that is mainly um, biodegradable, inert, inert and non-immunogenic. So, it doesn't show any um, specific toxicities. So, there are a few carriers that can be used that, um, that um, have these type of properties. And they are, the carriers also needs to be easily prepared and inexpensive. We already know how expensive it is to bring a new drug onto the market. It's between one and two billion dollars for each and every drug that makes it onto the market. So you don't want to increase the cost by using uh, uh, carriers that are not easily prepared and are very expensive. Then it becomes a problem because then you also add to the overall expenses associated with your um, drug design pro uh, with your with your new pro drug, and then also you need to make sure that the carrier is stable in the dosage form. So even before you give it to a patient, when it's um, on your shelf there in the pharmacy, you have to make sure that the carrier is stable and that it at least has a shelf life of 12 or 24 months. Um, and you need to be sure that it is stable in the dosage form, because what will happen if it's not stable in dosage form? It may already undergo um, certain chemical reactions and form degradation products, and the active is maybe then already released even before it is then um, given to the patient, which will um, which is not um, what we want with a pro drug approach. So this is just um, seven points on the ideal drug carrier. Um, so we we strive to 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 use ideal drug carriers in drug design and discovery. So let's have a look at carrier-linked prodrugs. We've already discussed uh, what a carrier-linked prodrug is. We know that the carrier-linked prodrug is the drug linked to a carrier group that is removed enzymatically, and we get bipartite, tripartite, and mutual carrier-linked prodrugs. And the most common activation reaction for the active to be released from the prodrug is known as hydrolysis um, that can happen through two type of enzyme systems. It's the esterase enzymes and the amidase enzymes. So some of the important functional groups that we use to develop carrier linked prodrugs and the two groups that get mainly, mainly used are alcohols and carboxylic acids. So they are the most common prodrug form is an ester. So if you use an alcohol and carboxylic acids and you do chemical reactions, what you will basically then have in the end is a, an ester. So those are the, that's the most common prodrug um, functional group that you will see when you develop um, prodrugs. So the alcohol or the carboxylic acid group of a drug may be reacted with the carrier to form an ester. This ester is then hydrolyzed in the body by esterase enzymes, or uh, yeah, in this case it's only esterase because we only made an ester. So it's uh, hydrolyzed in vivo by esterase enzymes to the active prodrug. 
So just to show you um, a quick schematic of what um, this type of reaction looks like and what an actual product looks like. Um, so for instance, if you have the drug, and the drug has a functional group known as an alcohol, then you can use a carrier, a carrier group that contains a carboxylic acid. And through organic synthesis, so this is an esterification reaction, an esterification reaction. So through organic synthesis, the esterification reaction, you can then form the product. So the esterification reaction happens by using the carboxylic acid, where the carboxylic acid can then react with the alcohol of the drug to form our product with the ester. So you can see this is a basic representation of what the product will look like. For instance, if you have the drug, the linker, which is now our ester, and then our carrier. So this is an ester-carrier linked product. We have the drug as well as the carrier. So this is what you will then basically have as your, as your uh, drug substance, and obviously then you will formulate it into your final pharmaceutical product that contains this molecule in your final pharmaceutical product. You will then give it to your patient, and once it's been given to the patient, then in the body, we get esterase enzymes. Um, esterase enzymes are very abundant in the body, and um, this esterase enzymes can then break this linkage. So it can cause hydrolysis. So it breaks this linkage between the O and the C double bond O group of the ester. And then what you will see what happens in the body then maybe once it's reached its site of action, then the carrier gets released again and the drug gets released and the drug is then active at the site where, where it needs to be active. So that's a, a very simple way in which we can explain what a prodrug is how you develop a product and also what happens with a product once it's inside the body. So just the other way around as well, so some cases your drug may contain a carboxylic acid. So that carboxylic acid can now not be uh, conjugated with another carboxylic acid. So in this case, then you'll use a carrier that has a, an, an hydroxyl group. So it's the carboxylic acid drug with the hydroxyl group carrier. And again, it's the same chemical reaction. It is an esterification reaction where the carboxylic acid of the drug, in this case, can react with the hydroxyl group of the carrier. Through the esterification reaction, form the prodrug with an ester. Once you give it to the patient inside the body, uh, metabolism will happen through the esterases enzymes to then release the active drug as well as the carrier once it's reached its site of action. So this is just an explanation again of, of, of what, um, uh, how a prodrug is used and um, how the active drug can then be released from the prodrug. So the most common prodrug form, as I've already said, is an ester. And esterases are important enzymes for the activation of these prodrugs. And there are three reasons why they are important. Esterases is generally present in all tissues in the body. So you can modify your structure to have an ester group. And then once it reaches a specific organ or a specific tissue in the body, then the esterases enzymes will convert it into the active uh, drug from your prodrug. With the esters, you can also prepare esters with any degree of hydrophilicity or lipophilicity. So you can adjust the molecule to maybe be more water-soluble, or you can also do adjust the, the, the molecule through the carrier that you use to increase the lipophilicity. And ester stability can also be controlled by appropriate electronic and steric manipulations. So if you want a drug to be um, highly stable, then you can maybe use a carrier-linked product that causes certain steric hindrances around the ester to make it a prolonged release drug because then um, there won't be a lot of esterase enzymes that can actually uh, um, cause the, the, the metabolism to, 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 take, uh, to, to happen and then you improve the stability of the ester. I'll show you an example of this um, a little bit later in our slides. So, for the ester carrier linked um, prodrugs, I want to show you some of the carriers that we can use. And the one carrier, and some of the carriers that we can use for esters um, to get a molecule with the desired hydrophilic or hydrophobic character can then be prepared. So, you can use certain 
carriers to make the drug more hydrophilic, more water soluble, or more hydrophobic. So for instance, if you have a drug that contains an alcohol group, you will have to then connect it to a carrier that has a carboxylic acid group. So carriers with aromatic or aliphatic functional groups decreases the aqueous solubility. So remember what I said in some of our drug design and discovery lectures, the more carbons you have in your structure, the higher the lipophilic nature of the molecule will be, so the more fat soluble it will be. So for instance, if we have the carrier and on this R group we have a methyl group, so the molecule may be more water soluble in this case because it only has this one carbon, uh, the CH3 group on the R position, but as you increase the chain length to an ethyl, to a propyl, bethyl, and so on, or maybe even to a 10 carbon spacer, then it increases the lipophilic nature. Go back to homology so that you know what happens when you have different chain links of carbons and how it increases the lipophilic nature. So you can maybe use a carrier group that contains a carboxylic acid with eight carbons, and then you can make a drug that is highly lipid and soluble. So if your drug maybe has a problem with um, water solubility, you want to increase the, lip the lipid solubility, you can use this homology approach of a carrier that has different chain links to get to the optimal um, lipophilic nature of the molecule. Then also you can use um, aromatics, Definitely aromatic groups, aromatic groups that can be conjugated on this R position. So a carrier that is an aromatic has an aromatic already contains quite a number of carbons and that will always then increase the lipid solubility of your molecule. So in this case if you have a carrier that is an aromatic group and a carboxylic acid, it can then be conjugated to a drug that has a, an alcohol group for an, through an esterification reaction to form the prodrug. Then we also have carriers which contain amino or carboxylic acid functional groups and that can be then used to increase the aqueous solubility of, of your drug. So for instance, like we've already said in, some, uh, in, in one of our drug design lectures that if a, a, a compound is protonated or ionized at physiological pH, it will increase the water solubility. Go back to that one example of metoprolol. Um, where I showed you what happened to metaprolol if it's protonated and if the pH is low and what happens when the pH is higher. So you can actually then increase water solubility by um, having a molecule that is protonated or ionized. So in, for instance in this case is where you have maybe a drug that has the alcohol, you've conjugated to a carrier with a carboxylic acid to form this prodrug which is now an ester and you can see it contains this NH group that should be protonated at physiological pH, or it will be protonated at physiological pH, thus increasing the water solubility of your, of your drug. And then also this carrier, in this case, even if it's an aromatic group, it contains this NH, which is protonated, and if it's protonated, you can increase the water solubility of your prodrug. So if you, for instance, want to develop this into an IV solution, now it's water soluble enough to be dissolved in the water, it can be given intravenously um, and then once it's in the body it can undergo metabolism and then your active drug will then be, be released. This is a, just another example of a carrier which contains a carboxylic acid and the carboxylic acid can be ionized at physiological pH in the body and that ionization will increase the water solubility of this intact prodrug thus enabling us to maybe formulate it into an aqueous soluble dosage form. Then you can also use sulfate and phosphate esters to increase um, aqueous solubility. So the same principle in this case is you can see that the phosphate um, is ionized and in this case the sulfate can also be ionized and we know that ionization of a molecule will increase the aqueous solubility. So if you want to increase the aqueous solubility of your product, this uh, these are the approaches that you can, can actually use. Then you can also modify the stability of esters. Um, where that can be controlled through manipulation of steric and electronic factors. And the rate of hydrolysis of an ester-containing prodrug may be increased by using succinic acid as a carrier. So succinic acid is a carrier that is inert, it's safe, and it um, is non-immunogenic. Um, so, for instance, if you have the drug and you have the succinic acid, this is what succinic acid looks like. Um, the succinic acid can cause 
uh, intermolecular catalyst catalyst that can increase the rate of hydrolysis of the ester. So if you want something that you only want to use in formulation, so maybe if you have an oil or a, a, a gas or something that's a volatile um, solvent and you want to maybe convert it into an, um, a solid dosage form, then you can use the succinic acid. The succinic acid um, carrier will then enable the drug to be in a solid form so that you can formulate it but now you want the drug to be quickly released in the body maybe already in the gastrointestinal tract so then the succinic acid will be released quite quickly um, and therefore it can increase the rate of activation of the pro drug um, so in that case then you can use the succinic acid uh, uh, carrier so it's not necessary to to know this whole mechanism just know that you can use succinic acid if you want to increase the rate of hydrolysis of your pro drug. So um, I've already given you an example of when you would like the rate of hydrolysis to be, be increased. So succinic acid can cause a drug to rapidly hydrolysize in the acidic medium of the gastrointestinal tract. So if you want something to be rapidly hydrolysized in the gastrointestinal tract, you can use succinic acid as a pro drug. Uh, or as a carrier uh, for your prodrug. Then the rate of hydrolysis of ester-containing prodrugs may be reduced by substitution with long-chain aliphatic carbon. So this is more on the pharmacokinetics. So if you have a drug that has a number of carbons on this R position, then there's more sterical hindrance around this ester. And the more sterical hindrance there is, then it will slow down the hydrolysis. So this can cause steric hindrance with the metabolic enzymes, in this case obviously the esterase enzymes, thus slowing down hydrolysis. So any sterical hindrance that can happen there will then make it difficult for these enzymes to attack this carboxylic acid to cause that hydrolysis to happen. So steric hindrances can make a drug so that, it, um, so that it's quite stable and hydrolysis is very very slow and this is an approach that has been used to develop um, um, slow-release drugs. So, release, uh, so drugs that get released over um, maybe a few days or maybe even over a few weeks. So if you want to develop a slow-release drug, you can use this approach um, to protect the ester from the esterase enzymes through using this um, steric hindrance approach. Then I think this is where I will stop uh, with this first lecture on... Um, on the uh, products and delivery systems. What we will do in the next lecture is to discuss other important functional groups that you can use for carrier linked products. And in this case, it will be the amine functional groups that you can use um, in, in carrier linked products. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I really do hope that you enjoyed this first lecture on products. Please make sure that you go through my notes as well. Go through the slideshow again and make sure that you understand it. And then um, in next week, you can come and ask me any questions that you may have on this specific section. Thank you.